Okay, so the topic is, uh, or the question is, would a LGBT person be welcome in the mosque? So the question is, when did idol worship got started, right? Yeah. So you think every answer is in the Quran, every single answer? That how to do a brain surgery? <laughs> Not that one, all right? Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful. And welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum. Do you know what I said? No? Some foreign language? It means peace of God be upon each single one of you. So the reason we say this is because when we meet each other, that's the greeting that we give to each other. And that's not unique by the way. Even uniquer than that is that we are also following Jesus and all the prophets. When they used to meet their people, they used to greet with that same greeting. Peace be upon you. Now, you may be wondering why are we having this mosque open house? Uh, one of the reasons is that people have fear of the unknown. And sometimes from a psychological point of view, when people have fear of the unknown, uh, it may lead to bias, discrimination, hate, and unfortunately, violence. But when people, when they meet with each other, right, smile at each other, uh, break bread with each other, and learn and educate, then we have seen that fear of the unknown goes away. And now we realize that there are so many commonalities between us. So we hope and pray that based upon the commonalities and working on the commonalities, we can make better societies. All right. So how many of you are coming here for the very first time? Oh, majority of you. Wow. How has been the experience so far? Yeah, great. So my job today is to give like a brief intro to Islam, even though you may have uh, gotten bits and pieces, right, from the excellent, amazing volunteers. So I would give like a brief intro to Islam in four points, maybe in about maybe seven or ten minutes max. Then I would like to take any questions, any comments that you have, because we can keep it engaging. All right. So if someone asks me what Islam is, I would say that there are four important themes within Islam. So the very first theme I would say is that we believe in the absolute oneness of God. So we say that God is only one. So if I ask you this question, the guests who, uh, who are here, what do you think is the name of God in the Arabic language? What would you say? No, not Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? No. I mean, you know the answer, obviously. <laughs> of course, right? Yes, the word Allah. So when we say the word Allah, some people, they may think that we are worshipping a different God. They may think that, you know, Allah is the God of the Muslims, the Arabs, the Middle Eastern people. That's not the case. You know, just like in different languages, you have name for God. Um, in Spanish, it is Dios. In Norwegian, it is Good. In the Hebrew language, the language of the Old Testament, it is uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, right? Elohim. In Arabic, it is Allah. So what do you think was the language of Jesus? Anyone? Without Googling it now, right? <laughs> Aramaic language, yes. The name for God in that language is very close to the word Allah. It is Ilah or Allah, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. So Allah is not a new God, He's the universal God, just so, in the, uh, just so in the Arabic language, we call Him as Allah. Now Allah has wonderful attributes, He has wonderful names. We say that He's one, He's not a trinity, He's not multiple persons. We say that He is uh, the creator, He's the sustainer, He is uh, independent. All of you may have some refreshments, but God does, He does not get hungry, right? He is independent. He does not need anyone. We need Him. Other important attributes of God is that He is a loving God. He loves humanity. He wants to guide humanity. So the important point is to help and guide humanity. What Islam says is that God does not come down and become a human. God remains God and then He appoints from the humans messengers and prophets. So that's point number two. So some of you may know the names of some of the messengers. Uh, you know, there may be so many, so many poster boards. 
maybe the tour guides may have mentioned to you. Can you mention to me at least three messengers of God mentioned in the Quran, which are also there in the Old Testament? What would you say? Jesus. There you go. Jesus, peace be upon him, is one. Let's hear two more. And you can get her help if you want, okay? <laughs> Right, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Prophet Moses, peace, you're helping her, right? <laughs> okay, okay, fine. <laughs> you knew the language, right? You knew it. Yes. Very good. So Prophet Moses, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them, and also other prophets. All right, time for a quiz. Which prophet do you think of all the prophets in the Quran that is mentioned the most by name? And a hint is this. He is the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Without any help from any Muslim, all right? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, uh, prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his by name, he's mentioned only four times. Uh, which other prophet someone mentioned? Abraham is mentioned the second most number of times, 69 times. There is somebody else who's mentioned the most number. Yes, go for it. Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus, he's mentioned 25 times. There we go, she got it. All right. Prophet Moses, he's the most mentioned prophet in the Quran. He's mentioned 136 times. Okay, who do you think is the only woman mentioned by name in the whole Quran? You guys know that, how? Because we've been told today. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> I applaud the tour guides. Good job, right? So here is an important fact. See, if, uh, if the Quran was coming from the mind of Muhammad, peace be upon him, he would have had his wife's name in the Quran, his mother's name perhaps, you know, maybe his daughter's name in there. None of them are present in the Quran by name. But a lady, quote unquote, a Jewish lady who came 600 years before him, he never met her. Her name is mentioned in the Quran, the only lady mentioned by name. Not even that, by the way, look at this amazing fact. She is the lady who is honored in the Quran. Uh, an angel was sent uh, to Mary, and that angel is saying, this is in chapter 3 of the Quran, verse number 42. So in this passage of the Quran, uh, the, so the angel is saying to Mary, that, oh Mary, God has chosen you, and God has purified you, and God has chosen you above all the women. So that distinction, that honor, and that respect is not given to any lady in the whole world, in the history. Only Mary, she is given that honor. So again, the point is, if the Quran was coming from the mind of the Prophet, why would he praise a lady 600 years who came before him? He never met. Thank you. Zakallah khair. So the Prophets of Islam, we say that... Uh, each single, each single one of them, uh, they were given the Islamic commandment or they were given the basics of Islam that invites your people not to worship humans and idols uh, and the plants, the trees, the sun and the moon, but invites your people only to submit to one God. So a question to all of you would be, what is that one word in Arabic that describes the submission to the one creator? What would you say? Did they tell you that there? No, I haven't told us that. Man, you guys forgot, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who are the tour guides? <laughs> you guys know it, okay? It is all over the place. Every poster may have that word in there. It starts with the... No, it's not Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? I'm not looking for the name of a person. I'm... Huh? Faith. Uh, okay, let me rephrase it again. There is one Arabic word... That means, that signifies the concept of submission to one God. It starts with the letter I. Al-Iman. Yes. Islam. Islam, right? So if you ask my fourth grader, uh, okay, Ibrahim Yusuf, what do you think Islam is? And he would say submission to one God. So what we say is that God, he gave that important, uh, you know, guidance to the very first man, Adam. That Tell your people, right, your progeny, they should not worship idols and other humans and the plant, the tree, the creation, but only submit to one God. So we say that that concept of submission to one God 
is coming from God to all the prophets, including the very first prophet, Adam. And that same concept was given to all the prophets and all the messengers. So in that sense, and this is one of the important points I'm saying to you, in that sense we say that Islam is not a 7th century faith. Islam was not founded by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There is no founder of Islam. Islam as a guidance was given by a loving creator. So humanity knows what guidance is and who to worship and what is the purpose of life. All right, so that's point two of the four points. The third important point is, you know, when we go to schools and colleges, there is always uh, some uh, notes, some textbook, or some, uh, you know, guidance the teacher gives to us. So we can excel, we can be educated, so we can pass, we can graduate. So God did not left us alone. He gave uh, different scriptures to the prophets of the past. So a scripture was given to... Uh, uh, Abraham and Moses and David and yes, Jesus, peace be upon them. What we say is that those scriptures did not came down to us in a pure form. So God gave the last and the final scripture to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So what do you think is the name of that scripture? It is in the gift bag and she is holding it. Yeah. There you go, yeah. the Quran. So we say that you have the Old Testament, then you have the New Testament, the Quran is the last testament. The Quran did not came only for the Arabs or the Muslims. Quran came according to the Quran, according to God, as the guidance for all of humanity. Because in the Quran, uh, you have solutions for the problems we are all going through. How to raise good families, how to have that bonding between husband and wife, how to be good to neighbors, solutions uh, against racism homicide, suicide, breakdown of the family structure, right? Gambling, extremism. Any solution society needs, the Quran has perfect solutions, practical solutions, workable solutions. Anyone, any society they tried in the past, they have had wholesome, just moral societies. All right, so that's point number three. So all of you, you will get a free copy today, right? So in the backs, you will have a free copy. You have one? All right, and the last important uh, concept within Islam is that uh, the concept of the hereafter. You know, again, giving the analogy, uh, those, who are, those who work anywhere, every six months, maybe every year, there is an evaluation done by our employer. The evaluation is based upon, okay, the assignment that was given to us, how did we perform that? In the same way, we say that uh, one day we all have to die. But that's not the end of our existence. After we are brought back to life, there would be a day of resurrection and a day of judgment. So God is going to judge each single one of us according to Islam for how we live this life. So we say this life is a life of preparation. So on the day of judgment, God wants to see that uh, what belief that we had and what kind of deeds that we have done. So if a person according to the Quran, chapter 2 verse number 25, if we have the right belief, worshipping only one God, not taking any human or, or idol or plant, the tree, any creation as God, but only worshipping one God and following God's commandments to the best of the ability. If we fulfill those two conditions, then God mentions in the Quran chapter 2 verse number 25, God guarantees those people eternal paradise. But there's a flip side to it, right? Suppose in the school, if a student does not come to class, skips the classes, does not do the assignment, does not obey the teacher, there would be consequences. So same thing in this life, if a person rejects the creator, right, does not follow the guidance, do wrong things, does not ask for forgiveness, there would be consequences. Islam does believe in a hellfire. But I hope and pray that all of us, that we obey the creator, follow his guidance, uh, by his mercy that we all get inducted into eternal paradise. Amen. So let me end with a profound passage of the Quran that uh, our brother recited. Let me mention that again, the translation. Then we can open the floor for Q&A, inshallah. So let's listen to this passage again, right, as a reminder. So this is in chapter 49 of the Quran, verse number 13. Chapter 49, verse number 13, our creator addressing to all of us, not only to Muslims, he's addressing to all of us, he's saying, 
that O oh mankind, O oh humanity, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into nations and peoples and tribes that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and despite and discriminate with each other. God is saying that we get to know each other. Then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered, God-fearing person. So I hope and pray that with God's guidance, that all of us will live as brothers and sisters and we eradicate all the chaos and the racism and the anti-Semitism and the Islamophobia and the oppression and the gun violence and we establish societies which are based upon morality, based upon unity and based upon justice. And the outcome, inshallah, would be nothing less than loving peace. May God guide us and may God bless us Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. All right. Any question is a fair question. You better ask the questions here than going to homes and asking from Mr. Google. All right? You may not get the right answers. And we will try our best to give the right answer. Go ahead. I would like to know what the Quran or your religion would say about gay married gay, gay people sure sure so the question is what does the quran says and what does islam says about lgbt or about especially about homosexuality or so right okay it's really important that first and foremost the premise is this that god is the creator any commandment that god has given it it benefits us so God has given comprehensive commandments in the Quran, also commandments for how to have wholesome families. See, family structure is the foundation of any civilization. A family, a stronger the family, the healthy a civilization, a country, a culture is. So God has many uh, commandments and guidance for the family. So a family in Islam is... Uh, so the marriage in Islam is only between a male and a female, not between two males or two females. And intimacy in Islam is only within marriage, no premarital and no extramarital. That's important, right? Second thing is, in Islam, according to the Quran, in the chapter that he recited and I recited, God has mentioned that I have created you from one single male and one single female. That means according to God's plan, there are only two genders. According to God's plan, right? There are only two genders. And Allah, God has honored both the genders. If he made somebody as a female, he made you as a perfect creation. He honored you. If he made you as a male, he made you in the best, the wisest way. And he honored you. So males and females, they have different roles. So if I'm as a male, I don't want to desire to be the opposite gender and vice versa. So in Islam, there is no such thing as uh, changing the gender. That's important, right? Uh, the only exception, so there is one exception to it. If a baby is born with intersex or uh, the organs uh, are uh, ambiguous, that's the only time with the consent of the parents and the help of the legal advice, and with the, uh, with, the, with the physicians, that's when the surgery can be done. But a person who is a born male and a born female, Islam does not advise and does not discourage, uh, and discourages and prohibits taking hormones or taking the surgeries. Now we do understand that some people may have desires, right? Which is common. From a biological point of view, psychological point of view, people may have desires. But Islam came to uh, give patience to the person, discipline to the person, and reward to the person if they are patient and persevering, following God's guidance, despite their desire to have intimacy with the same gender. So this is coming from God, and uh, whatever God does and says and provides to us, there is always a wisdom behind it. Excuse me, if that's the case, um, would someone who is gay or LGBT be welcomed into the mosque? Or... Okay, so the topic is, uh, or the question is, would a LGBT person be welcome in the mosque? I would say 100% yes, 
but obviously within the guidelines of a mosque, of a church, of a synagogue. Because, you know, this is a place of worship. We have a section where men pray, and there is a segregation where women pray. Right? So even if a person changing the gender or having gender inclinations, if that person comes to the mosque, obviously we will remind that person about God's guidance. This is the guidance that our creator has given to us. You know, suppose if I'm doing something wrong, by the way, we are not perfect. I would like my brothers, my sisters to correct me and to educate me. In the same way, nobody is going to, so there is no checklist at the entrance of the mosque, right? Did you, had, did you smoke today? <laughs> did you backbite it today? Right? Were you good to your parents? There's no checklist up there. Everyone is welcome. So it's important that mosque is open to everyone. And obviously, we need to remind and educate each other. This is God's guidance. If we abide by it, there's a benefit for us in this world and definitely, inshallah, in the hereafter. My question is, when the idealism comes, like, you know, when Prophet Adam was created, there wasn't no worshipping in sort of idol. When it is first started? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, uh, can you increase the mic? Is there a way to increase it? So the question is, when did idol worship got started, right? Yeah. Because uh, if God gave monotheistic uh, belief, okay, <laughs> then that's good. <laughs> so I don't have to like raise my voice. That helps. Uh. So the question is, when did idol worship got started? And that's a big lesson for us in this uh, question and answer. See, God gave uh, only God worship on the monotheism to all the prophets, all the messengers. So what happened was many generations after prophet, uh, prophet Noah, what happened was there used to be these three pious people in this one locality, in this one city. They were so pious, they were activists, they were peace ambassadors, everyone used to like them. So after they passed away, the people in that country, they want to honor them, they want to recognize them. So what they did was, they made this, uh, or statues of these people, just to honor them, not to worship them. Then after this generation was gone, some other generation came, and that generation elevated them to be more than just those, uh, you know, sculptures. They started to take them as mediators, they started to focus to God, but through these people. They, they started to take them as mediators. Then one more generation came, they took away God from the picture, and these uh, statues, they became idols. People started to worship them. So they started, so who, did somebody advise them? Like in a Iblis or somebody, just, or they just made it? Well, I mean, so we also believe in Satan. Yeah. Satan could advise, but ultimately it's the choice of a human to reject Satan and to follow the Creator. Shaitan is not going to, okay, you know, pushing us to do the idol worship or to eat the pork or kill a person. Ultimately, the accountability is on that person. So an important lesson for all of us, and this is what Islam says, right? So when you were getting the tour of the mosque, you may have seen or noticed there is no, uh, de de there is no depiction of God. There is no depiction of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There are no statues of saints, prophets, even of the Creator. Islam is a symbolless faith. When we pray to God, we don't go through Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's not son of God. He's not God. He's a creation of God. So when we pray to God, we pray to God directly. Because the believers, we all agree that God is all-knowing. If God is all-knowing, why do I have to go through a person? I can directly pray to him. I can directly repent to him for my sins. And I can directly ask anything that I want directly through him without going through any mediator. So Islam, so, so the reason Islam does not have any images, just to avoid going in the steps towards worshipping that image eventually. So that's the logic and the reason and the wisdom behind not having any images of anyone, even of God. Good question, by the way, mashallah. <laughs> Go ahead, more questions. <laughs> anything about the Quran, anything about uh, comparative religion, about Muhammad, peace be upon him, about Jesus, about misconceptions? Go for it. The front row is quiet over here. It's your turn, <laughs> right? <laughs> and in other things, like 
is only Maryam, Surya Maryam is in the Quran, this only lady. <coughs> also, Maryam's family is named, like in Imran, Surya Al Imran, isn't it Maryam's family? Yes, so yes. Why, is there any reason why God has chosen the for it was his decision to be chosen his family as a, in, in Quran? So, so it's important. So the question is, why did God choose only Mary or her family or certain prophets are mentioned in the Quran uh, compared to some other prophets, right? It's, so it's important. God loves all of humanity. God is a fair God. God is a just God. So according to the Quran, chapter 16, verse number 36, God is saying, and the, and the translation is, that God is addressing to humanity and saying that I have appointed messengers and prophets to all the nations of the past, all the people of the past, and they came with one fundamental belief, to invite humanity to the submission of one God, not to worship the creation, but worship the creator. So just because God is highlighting certain prophets does not mean that they were the only prophets they were sent to humanity. Definitely, so according to Islam, close to 120,000 prophets and messengers they were sent to all the people of the past and all the nations of the past. So that's a big possibility that a prophet may have came to Manchester, right? Mm -hmm. To people of the Caribbean islands, Australia, China, Japan, Russia, Europe, Africa, all over the place. So just imagine if God would have highlighted the stories, the challenges, the message, the mission of all the prophets, 120,000 of them, the Quran would be from that wall to that wall, right? <laughs> You have to carry it like, you know, by in a crane maybe. So just to make it easy for us to learn the lessons, God only highlights certain prophets and certain messengers so we can obtain the, let, uh, we can obtain the lessons from them. So for that reason, God only highlights certain people, certain women, certain men, certain prophets and certain families. What, what, what do you think is the biggest barrier for people embracing Islam? Okay. What is the biggest barrier for people to embrace Islam? Uh, there can be many things. So first and foremost, uh, a person may not uh, be educated about the beauty of Islam. They may think that Islam is a foreign faith. They may think that Islam is the faith of those other people. They may not know that Islam came as a guidance for every single human. I don't have a monopoly on Islam, neither does she. Quran is not my monopoly. Quran came for each single one of you. So first and foremost, we need to know that important fact. Second reason, some people, they may be, they, it could be a hindrance for them to embrace Islam is because they may fear that if they embrace Islam, what will happen through their family, uh, their friends, they may leave them, they may discard them. So that can also be one of the fears. But some other people, they may have some doubts about certain concepts within Islam. How come, you know, these roles are given to women compared to men? How come uh, there is a disparity between uh, the guidance uh, about inheritance, about witnesses, about uh, the concept of, uh, you know, fighting in Islam? Because they may be hearing from uh, the diluted sources and they may think that's what Islam is. So if a person clears the doubts and is uh, able to uh, educate themselves about the commandments of the Quran, and does not think, you know what, what will happen to my family? They still convert to Islam. Inshallah, God willing, they will become strong in their faith and they can be good practitioners of the faith and they can become, inshallah, God willing, the peace ambassadors of their faith. So if anyone is looking, right, with your own choice to take that step, we are here, right? I mean, so there is a choice in Islam. There is no compulsion. La ikhraha fiddin, as we say, right? There is no compulsion in faith. That means a person of their own choice, if they want to embrace, we can help them. If a person, despite hearing, they want to say, you know what, I will remain the way it is, no Muslim can force. Not even Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But obviously we say that, you know, Islam is a guidance. Ultimately, if you all want to go to paradise, we say as Muslims, that is the pathway to paradise. If we all believe in the same God, why does it matter? Okay, fine. Uh, so what, why does it matter? So that's a good question. It takes courage to ask the question, right? Why does it matter? Because uh, it's not enough for us to know that there is a God, but who God is? What is the concept of God? 
what do we say when we say that we believe in one God? Is that God, because Hindus may say that, you know, idol is a God. And obviously you may be as a Christian or somebody as a Jew person, you may say even though he's saying God, that Hindu person, but they are worshipping an idol. So it matters. It also matters that suppose if you go to school and uh, there are uh, two textbooks. Like suppose if you miss a class because something happened, you were sick. And the next day that you go, then you have a choice of getting the notes from a friend who takes really good notes or a friend who does not take as good notes. So it matters that where, which notes that you pick. It also matters that uh, the concept of salvation. Because if someone says that, you know, some animal has to die for your sins, some, uh, some uh, you know, person has to die for your sins, compared to nobody dies for your sins, and we have to repent for our sins. So it does matter. It also matters, lastly, that if God has given guidance, if we don't apply the guidance, we will be deprived and we will still be in our, uh, in, in, in our problems. So it's not enough for us to know that there is a God. It's equally important for us to know the concept of God, the purpose of life, and the scripture that we need to read. Not only is it enough for us to, uh, to do good deeds, God is the one to decide what good deeds are in a comprehensive way. We may be thinking just giving charity good to the neighbors is good. That is good, but that's not the completeness in goodness. So for all of these things, we need to know who God is and the scripture to follow and to practice. So all of these are, easy, uh, all of these are necessary for us to obtain the mercy of the creator. So for that reason, it matters. So you think every answer is in the Quran, every single answer? That how to do a brain surgery? <laughs> Not that one, all right? No. But the Quran does say that if you want to ask something, ask for people of knowledge. So even that answer is there, okay? But go ahead. Sorry, I stopped you in the middle. <laughs> no, that's all right. I just think that you, say, you believe that every answer is in that book, in that script. Sure. So let me just uh, give some context to it so you would understand. So humans, whatever that we need to live a life, a God-oriented life, to have wholesome families, you know, societies based upon justice and peace and morality, to have a, you know, ideal justice system, ideal economic and political system, ideal family, matrimonial, social system, an ideal society need to have all of these systems in place. And all of these systems, we say, for all of these systems, God has given us guidance how to make those systems and how to sustain those systems. On top of it, Quran has solutions against the problems that we are all going through. Poverty, right? Homelessness, disrespect of parents, racism, homicide, suicide, gambling, drug abuse. The Quran does have solutions, detailed solutions, workable solutions, practical solutions in the Quran and through the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For that reason, we say, my dear sister, that Islam is a complete way of life. So in that sense, we say, Quran has enough guidance for us to live a life that is God-oriented, and uh, its guidance is there applicable to a person in the seventh century, person now, and person until the end of time, inshallah. Yes. Can you maybe give an example, like for example, I, 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 I'm not going myself, but like in the Sharia, it says this, and the reason why it says this is so that we can Fine. Like this. Is that, sure. So that that's a really good point. Uh, usually, I, you know, in my open house sessions, I have a whole presentation, but I will say this. I take like the five, top five social issues, then I break it down, then I give like a detailed uh, stepwise solutions that Islam has given. Okay, so let's just take one, all right? Let's just take one. Let me see without the slides if I have memory or not, all right? Okay. I'm not sure about in the UK, but one third of the population in the US, they are obese, all right? So obesity is a problem. And because of obesity, you know, other problems come in. The cardiac problems, uh, the problems of the liver, problems of, you know, high cholesterol and diabetes, all of these problems because of overweight. What is Islamic solution? Islam does have solution, right? 
First and foremost, what Islam says is that uh, our bodies are a responsibility that God has given and will be held responsible on the day of judgment. How did you take care of the bodies? So the premise starts with that we have a right, our bodies have a right over us. So we have to take care of them, right? So we start with that. Secondly, what says that we have to exercise because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he encouraged for us that we have to have healthy bodies. So he gave us certain sports to play like swimming and horse riding in certain sports so we can have healthy bodies. Number three, uh, about what to eat and how much to eat. Islam has guidance in that also. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that the worst vessel a person can fill is the stomach. Then the Prophet said, if you have to eat, still uh, eat like small portions. But if you have to eat more, then eat one third. That makes you full. So suppose if three slices of pizza makes you full, eat only one slice. All right? <laughs> so if you divide your stomach into three portions, one portion is for food, one portion is for water, and the third portion you keep it empty for, for being active. Even what you eat, see, it's hold on. harsh, isn't it? No, it's not harsh. <laughs> okay, what is more harsh? Eating our full and then be, and being you know, unhealthy with all the problems and diluting our health, and then we cannot give quality times to our family, to our friends. We cannot have quality. Which one is harsh? Well, it's prejudicial to, to people who are plump. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's, it's prejudicial. It's just harsh and... You know, uh, if we go back like a century, if you take the, look at the photos up there of people in the beach, none of them were obese. Obesity is our cultural problem. We can have all the excuses saying that, you know, it's in our genes, but we can still control to some extent. So even what we eat, the Prophet said, and the Quran and Islam says that it has to be tayyab, it has to be healthy, right? It has to be healthy and we have to chew our food and we have to sit down and eat, and we have to eat with the right hand, right? All of these combined together is a perfect solution against obesity. Better than Jenny Craig, better than Seattle Sutton, better than any diet, any fad that may cost thousands and billions of dollars, the Islamic diet, it is free, it works, it worked in the past, and it's free for all of us. So that's what makes Islam and the Sharia a perfect solution, detailed solution to every problem that humanity is facing. I don't have time right now because he's saying like this. We have exactly the same, yeah, I will be kicked out, right? We have exactly the same detailed solutions against, uh, you know, racism and all the other issues. Fattish. What was that? It's, it's, it's similar to racism, it's fattish. No, it's saying if you eat one third, you're not going to be fat, so then... She will eat a third. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, once in a while, if you come to the mosque open house, if the samosas are tasty, perhaps you can eat more than one third, all right? I will, I will give that to you, okay, today, only exception for today. I'm not worried, I'm not worried, just keep some empty room. All right, guys, so again, in an awesome, it's an honor for us to receive you. Don't make this as the only time that you're coming. Come more times, contact us. Important that you're taking a copy of the Quran, do read it with an open mind. And despite any differences that we have, we have more commonalities. Let's work on the commonalities to make better societies. May God guide all of you and may God bless all of you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.